Good morning, Christ Church. Welcome. I'm glad we could be together, if only in this way. I think as we go through the morning, we'll find that we're together in a very special way, a very solid, enduring way, more so than you might think. A few words before we begin. Uh, first, you remember that today is Communion Sunday. Communion Sunday, that means we take the bread and the cup. You see them behind us here. I've got a small loaf of bread. I've got a little bit of grape juice. What have you got on hand? What have you got nearby that you can pull together for yourself or for you and your family, those of you who are watching this together? Later in the service, near the end of the service, we'll share the bread and the cup. You may have gotten word earlier in the week that we're going to do this today together so that um, we can respond to the, the command of our Lord Jesus, remember me and do this in remembrance of me to take the bread representing his body and the cup representing his blood poured out for us, meaning Jesus died for us. So if you don't have it in front of you already, please take a few moments, pause this video, take a few moments and find some bread or a cracker, something simple that you can eat and enough to share with those that you're with and something to put in your cup, grape juice, red wine, some other juice, something simple. These are times when we can't get everything that we need to get. So we get grace even in this, even as we uh, adjust the sacrament a bit because it's Christ's presence with us that makes this powerful. So if you haven't got your things together already, please take a moment, pause this, do that. And when you're back, um, start up the video again and we'll be back together and go from here. The Lord be with you. Communion, we celebrate Holy Communion today. It's the first Sunday of the month. It's also the last Sunday prior to Easter. The Sunday before Easter is called Palm Sunday. You see, we have some potted palms back here as well. Just to, anything we can do to remind ourselves of what Christ did for us, what Christ did for all humanity. Palm Sunday is, the, is our traditional name for Christians, traditional name for Christ riding into Jerusalem as a conquering hero and not as a conquering hero. When he came into the city of Jerusalem, the capital city, the crowds were so enthused that he was coming, riding into the city, they wanted to treat him like a conquering hero, like a, uh, like a king coming home, victorious battle. So they, they cut branches off the palm trees and Jesus rode in, but he rode in not on a war horse, but a donkey. What was that about? Well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is Palm Sunday, it's Communion Sunday. It is good to be together in the presence of the Lord. You didn't know we were gonna have a processional this morning, did you? The children, the choir, our musicians, uh, all came together last year or in, and a few years ago. And every year we celebrate Palm Sunday, we try to have a processional of some kind, just some way again to invite us into the action, what Jesus did for us, what Jesus did for all humanity. There's a psalm that's always used on Palm Sunday, a psalm that celebrates uh, the riding of God's victor, his, his, his king riding into Jerusalem. It would have been 
uh, sung every year, sung every year by the pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. We'll read it responsibly now. This is part of Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected. The Lord has done this. The Lord has done it this very day. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God. With bows in hand, you are our God and we will praise you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, you rode into Jerusalem that day to the acclamation of the crowds, their praises, their worship. How wonderful that they could celebrate you that way. Help us this morning to celebrate you with our, with our acclamation, with our praises, with our enthusiasm, with our whole being to celebrate what you've done for us, to celebrate that you do reign and rule, that you are our God. Let us gather again one day together all in the same room. Let us be your people caring for each other, even hands on. That would be a marvelous thing. We look for these days to cease, but we look for your reign and your rule to continue and increase. Make us people who love, make us people who pray. Teach us to always pray as you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So I'm very excited to be back with you again today, and I hope your kids will join join me um, today as we light our sixth candle on our Lenten cross. So if you're close to your screens and, and can get a little bit closer to see what we're doing here, that would be great. So thanks for being with us today. What I'd like to do is show you a few things um, because today's candle is the very special one, the green one, to celebrate Palm Sunday. And so I want to show you a couple of things. Um, these are these are crosses that were woven and made from palm branches last year. So they're dried now, and I'm going to move them away so that we don't light them on fire. Um, but they're they're woven from the palm branches that were used when we waved in celebration of Jesus' triumphal entry. And the word triumphal entry, that phrase, the word triumph means victory because we are celebrating the fact that Jesus came as a king. And so um, I want to read a little bit of scripture before we light our very special candle. So I'm going to read from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, starting with verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast, and this is the feast of Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, and this is from the prophet Zechariah. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And that's again from the Gospel of John. And I wanted to read that because um, it mentions palm branches. And palm branches were used at that time in a celebration of victory, waving them kind of like flags. And the donkey that Jesus rode on, not a big majestic horse, but a donkey was a symbol of humility, humbleness, and peace. So it's very important that that's in our scripture. And we also have a scripture that we say together, and that is from John 3.16. So if you would take a moment and say that with me before we light the candles, I would very much love to have that. So John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to light six candles, and we'll see if this little thing works today. And we'll start back here. One, two, uh -uh. And then our very special Palm Sunday candle, green to remind us of the palm branches. There we go. The other thing that I wanted to show you that I have on the table here too, is this wonderful mug. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. But all around the, the verse are palm branches. And this very special mug was given to me by one of our Sunday school teachers, Linda. Linda Roth, whose birthday it is today. So happy birthday, Linda, and thank you. And thank you for this wonderful reminder of the goodness of God. So you have a question to ask. And the question is, why do we light six candles? So as you remember, the first candle, let's say it's this one. The first candle is a reminder that God sent his son into the world as a baby to be our savior. So we're remembering the birth of Christ. The second candle is a reminder that Jesus grew as a young boy, obeying both God and his earthly parents. The third candle is a reminder that just as Jesus called his 12 disciples, we are all called to be his disciples and follow him too. The fourth candle is a reminder that Jesus was baptized as an example for us to repent and be cleansed from our sin. 
The fifth candle reminds us that Jesus taught his people and taught everybody what it means to be children of God. And today's candle, the sixth candle, reminds us that Jesus was both humble and a king. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your only son, Jesus, into the world to be our savior and to take away our sins. We praise your holy name. All right, and now it's time to snuff out the candles. And as the smoke rises, it's a reminder again of our prayers going to heaven. And then next week, we get to light the Easter candle. So we'll all be ablaze with the glory of Jesus. Thanks, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on Easter. One announcement. Uh, this coming Thursday, 7 p.m., there'll be a Monday Thursday service, not for you to attend here in the church building, but there'll be a video service that you can watch uh, together again with your family or by yourself if you need to be by yourself, if you find yourself by yourself. Monday, Thursday, Monday, um, from the Latin uh, meaning mandate. This is the commandment Thursday, the commandment. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Monday, Thursday is the day before Good Friday. It's usually celebrated in the evening before Good Friday. When Jesus gave this commandment, he had just finished washing his disciples' feet. The Monday, Thursday service, again, will be a communion service. If you can provide again for yourself something, some kind of bread and some kind of uh, juice in the cup, that will be a marvelous way again for us, just as Jesus shared the Passover with his disciples we'll share that bread and that cup together as we enter into that story of Jesus gathering his disciples for a last supper together. And Jesus gathering his disciples to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane where he was betrayed and arrested. And it's a horrible story. It's a lovely story because of the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. It's a marvelous, miraculous story of God's kindness and God's grace to us. Monday, Thursday, this coming Thursday, 7 p.m., a video service for us. Will you join me in our prayer of confession? It's the same prayer we've prayed the last two weeks. We need the practice. I need the practice. You'll see it on your screen. Let's read this together in unison. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let's continue in a spirit of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I can't imagine what it must have been like for you to send your son knowing that you were sending him to his death, knowing that you and he and the Spirit conspired together in love to redeem as many as would simply receive the gift of life from you. It's an astonishing story. It's an astonishingly powerful reality. So many of us have responded to that call, Lord, to, to become adopted into your family because of Christ's life, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection. Keep shaping our hearts, keep training out of us the self-centered ways that seem so natural and even so right when we're in the middle of them. Make us more and more ready to receive humility and grace and courage and kindness from you. Because we need humility and grace and courage and kindness to face what comes, 
There's a lot of us we find ourselves in the middle of, in strange situations, difficult, even deadly situations. So we look to you for help, not just in fending off the virus, not just in fending off the disease for ourselves and our loved ones, so, but so that we might reach out in appropriate ways with grace and humility and courage and kindness to anyone we can. Now is such a marvelous time, Lord, for you to work through us. That's our prayer, for you to work through us. Your strength, your holiness, your everlasting love is what we need poured through us. Wash us clean in the process. Make us gracious and kind to those we meet, to those who are serving us, those we must serve. We pray your special protection for medical workers and others on the front lines. We, we pray for great patience in us. We pray that somehow we might also, as people who are becoming patient and ready for anything, that you might shine through us, that people might know, and we might freely say, in a, in a great, calm, and relaxed, and happy way, be able to say, I don't know how else to explain it except that God is working on me and God is working through me. We would love that to be true, Father, for you to work on us and work through us. Lord, specific people and specific uh, circumstances are coming to mind now, and so we offer those prayers up to you. Um, hear the prayers even as we gather where we gather. Hear our prayers. Gracious Father, by your Spirit, give us the courage to come to you in all circumstances. We find ourselves distracted, we find ourselves harried and harassed, and it makes us no good to the person next to us or the person who might need us. We need so much wisdom in these days of trial, and unprecedented confusion. We need great wisdom for ourselves and for our leaders. And we need great confidence in you, which you offer, both wisdom and confidence for those who ask it. So hear our prayers that we might know and enjoy and share our confidence in you and great wisdom for the day. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for gathering us to yourself. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
The sermon text for this morning is from Matthew. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Let me read it for us. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in highest heaven. When Jesus entered, the, entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, sometimes you were so reserved, so careful about what you said to whom. And then there came this great moment where you rode into Jerusalem. Help us to recognize, Jesus, what you're doing or what you're about to do or what you've just done. Give us eyes to see and hearts to have confidence in the right things. Hearts to have confidence in you. Teach us this morning from your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I have a favorite joke. One of my favorite jokes. Ready? First guy asks, what time is it? Second guy says, you mean now? Isn't that great? That's one of my favorite, I love that joke. And now you know also why I don't generally tell jokes. Not jokes, not jokes that have a setup and a punchline. But I love this joke because it's, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. I mean, what, when you ask somebody what time it is, you don't say, what time is it in 12 BC? What time is it tomorrow afternoon at three? You don't ask past or future, you wanna know what time it is now. Now is pretty important to us. As a matter of fact, one could make the case that now is all we have. Now, of course, there are, there are silly arguments for, for, for a person to, to give up all their, their logical faculties and to give up all their scruples and all their morals to say, well, you know, now's the time, babe. Let's, you know. But there comes a time when now, there comes a meaning of the word that now is all we have. What time is it now? Is it now? What about two minutes from now? When we get there, will it be now? This now, that now. It's so important to realize that now is the time. Now was the time for Jesus to ride into Jerusalem. He's very savvy, cagey, wise. He is a better planner than anybody else on the planet was. He had advantages, he could be, but he absolutely was. This was not, oh, let's see, Uber is not operating right now, and, and Lyft is kind of to the side, so I'll see if I can find a donkey. Maybe I'll ride on the foal of a donkey. Jesus has this planned out. He sends disciples to go get his ride for him. And if they say anything, tell them the Lord has need of it, and they'll send it right away. Jesus has planned this, or he knows what's in the human heart, or somehow else he's made this happen because it, it unfolds as he said it would, and it 
It unfolds fairly easily. And he calls himself the Lord. In his context, nobody would call themselves the Lord, except a, maybe a lunatic. Tell him the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it because he's going to ride into Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the only place that matters right now. Passover is coming up and all of Israel is sending representatives and anybody who is in good health and mobile comes to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which is the declaration of independence for the Israelite people. The Passover as they were rescued by God from slavery in Egypt. They celebrate the Passover every year to mark this. It's a, it's a marvelous, massive feast. Jesus rides in not thinking, ah, it's gonna be crowded. Can't go there. I'll wait until uh, next week when the, no. He rides into the middle of the crowds. What's he doing? This is now, he says. I am the Lord, he says. He rides the short mile from Bethphage to Jerusalem, down into the valley, and up again, and the crowds go crazy. They, they're cutting palm branches. It's kind of a national symbol for Israel. This, this is a great day for our people. They're putting their cloaks on the ground and on the animals that he's riding uh, as, as a kind of a allegiance, a, a subservience even. We belong to this man. Here comes our king riding into Jerusalem. It's a dramatic, dramatic moment. A donkey, a foal of a donkey. Jesus is likely riding the, the smaller, younger of the two. The mom is right alongside to keep the colt from being skittish. The disciples are some mixture of, I can't believe this is happening, and I'm so glad that he's picked me to be on the inner circle, because wow, is this going to be great. And of course it is great. It's a great moment, and, it, and it, it's a great moment because it it's Jesus announcing himself as the king of Israel, riding into its capital city. And he rides in in a way that no Roman, no pagan would ride in. He is not coming in on a chariot. He is not dragging captives behind him all in chains as they would have in that time. He is not even riding on a war horse by himself. He's not Alexander the Great. He's not any of the Caesars, but he rides into Jerusalem as the Lord to claim it for himself. And to force the issue because he knows, he's absolutely savvy, he knows there are people for him, very much for him, and people very much against him and probably some who just don't know who he is, but, well, they know, they're going to know now. Who is this? They're saying from the sidelines, from the city. Who, who is this? This is Jesus. The, well, it's a pretty good answer, right? The last, verse 11, the crowds answered, this is Jesus. Got the name right. The prophet from Galilee got the home region right. Galilee, he's not from around there. He's an Israelite, yes, but he's not from the big city. So it's, it's kind of pretty much all there, all, all right, and mostly there. True, is it true enough? Jesus chooses a now moment to say, now is the time to decide. He rides into Jerusalem. The whole thing must have taken 20 minutes, a half an hour. The scriptures then spend anywhere from, the gospels in particular, spend anywhere from the, a quarter of their total content to a third of their total content talking about this week of Jesus' life. If you think you know anything about Jesus and you don't realize how much is in the scriptures about this last week of his life, you don't know Jesus. Or you've been piggybacking on somebody else's knowledge. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, or the in the triumphal entry, another phrase we use for it, shorthand. Because this is the signal, seminal moment when Jesus forces the issue. Are you for me or against me? And Jesus goes from there the next day into the temple, which ought to be the holiest place, the most revered place, in all of Israel, perhaps in the whole earth, because Israel's the center of the earth and Jerusalem's the center of Israel and the temple's the center of Jerusalem and the Holy of Holies is the most holy place in the temple. 
Jesus goes in and he drives out the, the money changers. He's forcing the issue even more, and this time even violently, not harming people, but saying you can't just have business as usual. You can't have business as usual if you're going to follow me. Now, it's, it's time to recognize Jesus is very clearly forcing the issue and saying, are you for me or against me? Come follow me. He's got the right to say, come follow me. He has the power to show that this is not just some guy. It's not even a talented guy. It's not even just a good teacher. He is giving signs and intimations and signals that God is at work. As a matter of fact, this is what it looks like when God shows up. Are you for God or against God? If you're for God, follow me. It's an astonishing thing to say. It is such a welcome thing that he says it because it forces the issue for you and for me and we get to choose. It's the same choice humanity's had since Eden. Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, walking in fellowship with God in the cool of the day, there's one rule. Follow reality, cooperate with reality, the reality of God's endless love in this place, in this paradise, your whole life long, or decide that you know better what good is and what evil is, what's good for you and what's bad for you. What do Adam and Eve do? They have one rule, don't eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. What do Adam and Eve do? They eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they know better than God. That's what their actions show. It didn't work out so well. It hasn't worked out so well. Jesus comes in to ride it into Jerusalem to force the issue to say, are you for God or against God? If you're for God, you're for me. It's an astonishing claim to make. He makes it simply even a little subtly, subtly, as he comes in to ride into Jerusalem. <laughs> he knows the time, that time was now. What time is it? You mean now? Yeah, we mean now. What other now do we have? What guarantee do you have about your future? What guarantee do I have about my future? What do I think my life is about? Aren't you asking some of these questions? There's, there's lots of questions during this coronavirus, COVID-19 period, right? It's how can I get something set up so I can work from home? How can I, how can I love my kids and teach my kids and do my job? How can I find something meaningful to do if I'm at home and retired and there's nothing to do. Do I just abandon myself to TV? Do I just let myself get overwhelmed in, in news? What's this about? What's this now for? Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day when you and I can choose again to let go of everything that will be taken from us. Let me say that again. Now is the day when you and I can choose to hold loosely, to let go of everything that one day will be taken from us. That sounds scary. That sounds harsh. It is sane. A man is no fool to give up what he can't keep in order to gain what he can't lose. We don't have guarantees about our health, our loved one's health. We do have guarantees that following Jesus pours life into us. We have guarantees from Jesus that say, if you believe in me, if you trust me with everything you've got, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die, and though he die, he will live. This is Jesus' cryptic language. 
poetic, even dilemma language saying, every mortal dies. Not every mortal lives. Jesus rides in gently to say, let me show you what reality looks like. Well, let me show you what God's love looks like. Let me show you that yes, God reigns and rules and he rules in love. And here's the way to health and wholeness and peace, even if you lose your health, even if you can't ever make yourself whole because you can't, even if you can't as much as humanity wants it, even if we can't conjure up any sort of a lasting peace, but in Christ we can, from Christ we can. As we follow Christ, we can. As he works in us and through us, he can. What's it mean that Christ would work in us and through us, pastor? It means that we would be willing to give up our career path for a daily check-in, a daily walk with Jesus, his priorities above ours. Now, he's, he's given you talents, he's given you opportunities, he's given you um, uh, priorities and, and hopes and dreams. And it, it, it's, it, some of them are just natural to being a human being. And we have the opportunity to say all of those can be good things. All of those might be part of the path I need to be on, but what I will do first and foremost every morning, say, Lord Jesus, author of life, good shepherd, I belong to you above else. I believe you can pour life into me and I want and I need your life in me. And I want and I need your life for my loved ones. And I want and I need your life for my friends. And Lord Jesus, because you told me to do this, I want and need your life flowing into my enemies because that's what they need too. Jesus comes to say, now's the time, now's the day of salvation. Now is the day to be rescued by me. Are you for me or against me? For some people, maybe for you, you're content to think that Jesus is a good teacher, was a good teacher, had some very interesting things to say. Maybe he got caught up in, a, in something a little bit bigger than him and, well, he died. Sad, tragic, but we remember him fondly. Are you that kind of person? You think that Jesus was a, was a good teacher? And maybe that's, that's pretty much it. I have a question. Have you read anything Jesus has written? Ah, I need to say that better, don't I? Jesus didn't write. His disciples, his witnesses, his students that were with him for three years and the colonies that, uh, the, that sprung up around his teaching and his person, around his resurrection, in his generation and the generations that followed, they wrote it down. They argued with each other, they wrestled it through, they formulated this, here's what he said, and here's what he meant, and here's what we need to remember. So my question is, if you think Jesus was a good teacher, have you actually read about him recently? How about now? How about last week? How about, how about when we're done here today? Have you actually read what he said? Have you read what people who knew him best, the eyewitnesses, his friends, do you know what they said about him, or are you just working on hearsay? If, you, if, you, if your view of who Jesus is, is from the 1950s, it's not gonna wear well now. If your understanding of who Jesus was and his importance in the world and what he can and wants to do through you is from 12 years ago when you were a teenager or 70 years ago when you were a teenager or a child and, and you didn't really like having to get dressed up to go to church or something, you're gonna have a pretty thin, pretty distorted view of who Jesus was. Why not read him for yourself? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's all kinds of things on TV, um, both movies about his life, some of them old, some of them recent, some of them terrible, some of them pretty okay. Really? Is that your best, best hope for finding out who Jesus really was? Is that really how you're gonna make your decision about what's important in life? Is that, is that how you're gonna know that you've got something solid, someone trustworthy to hang on to through difficult times? From long ago and far away when you weren't really even cognitively fully developed, that's, 
That's your approach to Jesus? The time is now. The time is so available to you and so pressing upon us all now to hold on to something, someone solid, someone who knows time, someone who has a great sense of timing, someone who is not afraid of death, someone who died, and someone who rose. Now we've narrowed down the field quite a bit, haven't we? Jesus died for you, died for me. Jesus rose from the dead. The Father raised him to break the power of sin in our life, to reunite us, to reestablish the relationship with the Father and with each other. And boy, don't we need help getting along with each other now. Boy, don't we need to be retrained about what it means to be alive and living and loving. And boy, do we get that in abundance from Jesus. Those of us who are followers now know those of us who are practicing now are learning. Following Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Time is now. The question is, what time is it? You mean now? And the question right behind it that the crowds ask is, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Do you know? Do you know him? Take some time to get to know him. Now, let's pray. Oh Jesus, I, I trust, we trust that there's never been anybody like you, nor will there ever be again. And that you, you witness even now to our hearts as we gather in prayer, that you witness to your strength and your goodness and your holiness and your kindness even as we gather in prayer, even as we read about you, even as we hear others speak about you, there's, there's power there, there's, there's a life there that wants to bless us, that wants to bless all who will follow him. So we pray, Lord, that we will always be increasingly receptive to who you are, who this Jesus is. And we pray, Lord, that, that those who are listening and watching to what we say and, and how, how we live our lives, we pray that they may see some glimpse of you that says they want to know more Jesus, know more about this Jesus and know this Jesus more. Thank you for pressing on us. Thank you for lifting us up. Thank you for being our firm place to stand and our firm leader to follow. <sighs> Thank you that you are so strong and so good and so good for everyone. Let us all, Lord, let us all turn to follow you, to learn from you about life, health, truth, safety, everything. We, we praise your name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, let's recite and read together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you haven't yet prepared your own little table with the bread and the cup, now's the time to do so. We participate in the, it's called communion, Holy Communion, it's a sacrament. It means it's a visible means of an invisible grace. It's not just a sign, but actually Christ present with us. The cup and the bread represent Christ's body and Christ's blood, Christ's death on our behalf. You know what happened, don't you? 
on the night when Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul reminds us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, may you be blessed forever. You have blessed us so very much. Thank you for your courage in life, your clarity about your mission, your willingness to reach out to the least and the last and the leftover people, and your willingness to stand up to those who were in power, who used that power for themselves and not for others. Thank you for your courage in your life. Thank you for your courage in your death to have left all the privileges of heaven for us. It staggers the mind, it boggles the mind. We, we hardly know what to think and do about it, but we are so grateful. And yes, of course, we respond to your invitation to come to the table, to share in your life and your death. And by your kindness, we even share in your resurrection. It's astonishing, almost too good to be true, except that you've said it and you've done it, so we believe it and we trust our lives to you. Be in this bread and this cup that as, you part as we partake of them, we might partake of you. Lord, we come to the table with so very little to offer, maybe not quite the right bread, maybe not quite grape juice, but we come as we are and trust that you will make us and these moments not just meaningful, but powerful, powerful for our transformation, a powerful experience of grace that we might receive and pass along as freely as you gave up your life for us. Thank you that by your spirit, you are at work among us. Thank you that by your spirit, you are at work within us. Thank you that we can share this precious time together we pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. So normally we would gather in a circle, a circle where we could look across at each other and see who looks like they're doing just fine and see who looks like they're, they're, they don't even feel like they, they deserve to be in, in God's presence, uh, in the circle, maybe even at church. When we're, when we're together again, it's, it's a good idea to keep, keep an eye out for who's hurting. Who's a little lost? Who looks like they might be ashamed? And it's a wonderful time to remember that we have logs in our own eyes and specks in a, in a brother or sister's eye. And we all come to the table needy. We all come to the table sinful. We all come to the table in need of God's kindness and grace and pure purity, purification. So think of those in our fellowship, those you already know that are regular with us and those who may be visiting for the first time, maybe somebody stumbled across this video, just looking for some reassurance that God is real and people care. That would mean we'd have opportunities, we'd have work, we'd have something to share after these moments together. For now, we share not around the circle, but scattered across greater Portland. Jesus knows where you are. Jesus more than makes up for my deficiencies and your deficiencies. Jesus invites us to share this meal together. Jesus invites us to share this life together. Take what you've got for bread. Take a piece. And if you're with others, offer the bread to them so that everyone's got some. And then offer the cup with the juice, the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you and for me. How we need it, how glad we are to receive it.
Make sure in your circle that everyone with you has an opportunity to receive the bread and the cup and an opportunity to just relax into the goodness of God who more than makes up for any and every difficulty that we have, more than makes up for, more than provides for us against any challenge coming our way. Again, the Lord be with you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So, brothers and sisters, receive this word from the Apostle Paul as you have received Christ himself. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and always. Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.